Did you know that out of all of the apostles, Jesus Christ probably spent more time with John while he was on the earth than he did with any other apostle, including Peter? This special relationship gave John a unique perspective when he wrote his canonized works. Today on The Trumpet Daily, we examine the Gospel of John. The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Trumpet Daily. The Gospel of John is one of the deepest books in all the Bible. John had an unusually close relationship with Jesus Christ. He was even called the Apostle whom Christ loved. Christ gave John special instruction during the many hours they spent together. You might say Jesus Christ personally prepared John for his career in writing. Added to that, John didn't write his gospel until about 30 years after the events it depicts. So he had a lot of time to contemplate what had occurred and what it all meant. The first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all cover essentially the same sequence of events in Jesus Christ's life. But John's gospel was different, as you'll see today. For the main message, we bring you another segment airing this weekend on my father's weekly program, The Key of David. I'd like to talk to you today about a new booklet that I have written, and it's uh, titled John's Gospel, The Love of God. And I believe it to be the most profound book that I have ever written, and I think mainly it's that way because John's Gospel is so deep and it certainly does take a lot of studying to really understand it the way you should. Now, I've written uh, over 40 booklets, and this is a rather large booklet, and I believe certainly this is the one that uh, is the most moving of all of them. And I'd like to talk to you about this today. Jesus Christ personally prepared John in a, in a very uh, intimate way to write and to speak and to uh, uh, fulfill his ministry. At the time he wrote this book, mo uh, I think all of the apostles were already killed, but John was allowed to live because John had work to do into his old age, and he did die a natural death in his old age as far as we can tell. So I want to discuss some of the points that I've covered in this booklet, some of the lessons. John discusses that prophet. Now he talks about a, that prophet that will be here, will actually introduce Christ to the world. Introduce Christ to the world. And who and where is he in this end time? John talks about that subject. And I think you'll find it fascinating. Second point is, John said to the Jews that you are gods. And that so enraged them, <laughs> that subject he was talking about, that they tried to stone him and tried to kill him. When he told them about the most awe-inspiring truth that man could ever hear. See, again, mankind doesn't understand the depth of these wonderful truths. That's why the whole world is deceived. John also discussed the death of Lazarus and said that Jesus wept. And that's the shortest verse in the Bible, and people talk about it all the time and discuss how Jesus wept. And I don't believe uh, anybody really understands, except for very few, that really understand why he wept. Now, let me tell you, it's not for the reason that most people think. Why did Christ weep there in, in the uh, story covered in uh, John 11? Also in John chapter 21, it is a subject about God's love. And yet I will show you in this booklet that even most of the commentaries don't understand what is God's 
love, that agape love of God, they don't understand it. In fact, even Peter and uh, the, those that were to become apostles didn't understand it, frankly, and Christ taught them. So this is a profound booklet, and it's a profound subject, and it's a profound gospel, but it's a wonderful, wonderful and inspiring book, one of the most inspiring certainly in all the Bible. So let's examine some of those points that I just discussed, but I'd like to begin, first of all, with one of the greatest examples in faith of faith in the Bible, and it's over in John 3 and verse 29. And here's how it reads. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. So the Apostle John is using John the Baptist to illustrate an important point. And it's so inspiring because John the Baptist was in a very difficult situation and he was about to face his, his own death. But verse 29, he that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, you can be God's friend, that's what John is saying, and we are God's friend if we obey him, which stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. Now John was listening to the bridegroom's voice. Now, the other Gospels discuss the bridegroom, but they don't bring the bride into it. John does, because John is about to die, and he wants to get the whole picture in his mind about the bridegroom and hearing the voice of the bridegroom. And if you hear the voice of the bridegroom, that means you're the bride of Christ, which is going to be the most exalted position that anybody ever has throughout all eternity. And it's comprised of those people who are called out and, and, and uh, get to know God before His second coming. Those uh, people called the first fruits in the Bible. So John understood that very well. Notice verse 30, he said, He must increase, but I must decrease. So he probably it certainly indicates that he knew that he was going to die and he, he wanted to keep that vision in his mind about, he said, look, I've heard the bridegroom's voice. And here's what I wrote in the booklet about John's gospel. When the bridegroom speaks, that means he's talking about the bride and the wedding. If you hear the bridegroom's voice, you are blissfully anticipating your marriage to Christ. Your whole life is focused on the wondrous, that wondrous vision. You are not going to get the depth of this concept unless you prayerfully study this booklet. It is that profound. John the Baptist listened to the wonderful, spiritually romantic voice of his husband. And here he was facing a time when his head was about to be cut off. And yet I want you to notice that it talks about him rejoicing greatly, about his joy being full, and he was about to die. Now, does that sound like faith, a real example of faith that he set for us? And doesn't that make all of us a little ashamed or maybe uh, very much ashamed because we don't have that kind of faith? But that's the kind of faith that John the Baptist had. And I wrote in the book that, yes, we suffer. We suffer with the bridegroom, but don't forget the marriage. See, don't, and in John's next waking moment, he will be involved in a marriage to Jesus Christ with the rest of the first fruits of the, the church called out in this age. So he knew how to die and he knew how to rejoice. And even in a trial like that, I mean, he didn't just rejoice. He rejoiced greatly, greatly. And he was just filled with God's joy at the time he was about to die, and he knew he was going to die. I think that's a pretty impressive example of faith. But let, let's look at some of those examples I talked about that uh, early on. And uh, first of all, I'll go to that prophet. What does, what does that mean? And who is that? And where is he in this end time? Notice verse 21. And they ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you that prophet? And he answered, no. No, he wasn't that prophet. 
But here we have one of the great mysteries of the Bible. Who is that prophet? Who is that prophet talked about in the end time? Actually, a, a personality. Now, the Jews knew there was going to be a prophet, and they didn't know exactly. They certainly didn't have a name for him, but they knew there was prophesied to be a prophet to come in the end time after Elijah, but they didn't know too much about him. But they knew it was all prophesied, like in Isaiah 40 and verse 9, it talks about that prophet who says, Behold your God. A man says, Behold your God, or he introduces Christ to the world in the, in, at his second coming. Now, that's a, those are amazing prophecies. And we have to know about some personalities and about some individuals. Look what... Lang's commentary says about that. In verses 21 and 25, that prophet, Lang's commentary says, it was the well-known prophet, a personage in their messianic theology, presumed to be familiar. Well, yes, he was familiar to them in their prophecies. That is the Jews. I wrote, this prophet was familiar to them because of their knowledge of prophecy. And Lang says, this particular prophet, therefore, is meant who should complete the forerunning office of Elijah. Wow, he's going to complete the office of Elijah. There's going to be an end time type of Elijah come on the scene. And then after that is going to be a personality called that prophet is coming on the scene. But who are these people? I mean, if we know about all these prophecies and we understand the truth of God, we have to know who they are or we don't know what God is doing because those two men are being used to fulfill God's prophecies. Verse 25, notice this. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptize you then if you be not that Christ? number one, nor Elijah, number two, neither that prophet. So here, three personalities are discussed. And most people think that prophet is Christ, but that doesn't make sense because they're both used here in verse 25. Three personalities are discussed, and the Jews knew that there was a difference between the, uh, the Messiah and that prophet. And for that matter, Elijah. They knew there were, were three personalities right here at the very end that would appear on the scene. Now, Langs has it right that uh, there is an end time Elijah. We've talked to you about that many times, and it's discussed in this booklet. And John will uh, really prove this subject to you. And if you want to know more about that prophet, there's even more material, certainly a booklet that will be offered to you in that uh, booklet to uh, give you more insight into that if you're interested. And God knows we ought to be interested in this end time. I, I think all of us could agree on that. Another point that I discussed in that booklet about John's gospel was what Christ said to the Jews. Now, he said that, that you are gods. You are gods. And they, as I said earlier, actually were going to, or trying to stone him to death. It just, like it put them into some kind of a fierce rage when he told them you are gods in the context that, that he's discussing here. But can you, can you and I get our emotions out of the way when we're discussing God's truth and make sure that we understand what God is teaching us? Because it's not always easy to understand. God makes that very clear. Sometimes it's rather difficult. Sometimes it's rather hard to understand. And, and certainly this subject is an, an enigma to the whole world. I'm telling you, they don't understand. The whole world is deceived about this subject. You are gods. What does that mean? I mean, that's, a, that's an astounding statement. Notice John 10, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. 
Jesus answered them, uh, Many good works have I showed you from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me? Verse 33, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy, and because that you, being a man, make yourself God. <laughs> now here, uh, he was God in the flesh. He was the Word that became, came to this earth and became the Son of God. John 1 talks about that, the Gospel of John, and this booklet talks about it. But they said, well, that's blasphemy. You, you're, made, you, you're, uh, you're a man. You're not God, but He was God in the flesh. He was begotten by His Father. The Father, was, uh, the Father God was uh, the one that begot Him. And He was born to a woman, uh, but still... God the Father begot him. And he was a man or a God, a God in the, in the flesh, but they didn't like that at all. And they were really, really uh, upset about that. And it is, it is uh, certainly something that's, well, we have to get our emotions aside if we're going to grasp this, I think. But notice verse 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? They said, Well, hey, you're getting upset because I say I'm God in the flesh. But did you know, don't you understand that I said in your own Bible that you are gods? What did Christ mean by that? Should we get excited about it and try to understand it? Or should we stone Christ? <laughs> That's what the Jews did. I mean, that's really what they did. They just couldn't comprehend this and said it was all blasphemy. But it isn't. It's right there in your Bible, Old and New Testament. And he was wondering, trying to get them to see, well, now don't get upset because I'm talking about the most awe-inspiring subject in the Bible, and that is really your potential as far as human beings are concerned. It's the most inspiring of all subjects. And he was quoting from Psalm 82 and verse 6. If you want to read that, it says there, I can quickly read it to you. I have said, you are gods and all of your, you are children of the Most High. That he just took the Jews' own Bible and quoted their own scripture and told them what their potential was. Now it says in Genesis 1 and verse 2, verses 24 through 26, the very first chapter of the Bible, I've quoted it many times, that uh, the animals were made after the animal kind. And then came man, and man was made after the God kind, in God's likeness, in God's, and, and to be made into God's image or God's very own character. Well, that's, that's an important subject of this booklet, and I'll get in and quickly move along here uh, to the third point. Jesus wept there in John 11. Well, what does that mean, that Jesus wept? The Jews thought he was weeping because Lazarus was dead, but Jesus Christ came there to resurrect Lazarus. And what was he weeping about? I mean, he, he was with people that had been with him for a long time, and he said, I'm going to resurrect Lazarus. They didn't believe him. <laughs> they didn't believe him. They, he said that he's just asleep. I'm going to resurrect him. And he did resurrect Lazarus right before their eyes. So why did he weep? Well, he said uh, that he wept, it says there, and, and you'll see that very clearly in the booklet, that he wept because of their lack of faith. After all the time he was with them, they still didn't believe that this God in the flesh could resurrect a man that was in his grave to live again right before their eyes, but he did. And they just couldn't believe he could resurrect somebody. And Christ said, well, I am the resurrection. If you don't believe that, well, you, you don't have faith enough to even be in my family and in the kingdom of God. Pretty strong words. But I'll tell you this. We can have that very faith. Christ said, when he returns, shall he find faith on the earth? And he was saying that, no, he wouldn't find any real faith like he should on this earth when he returns. An absolute condemnation of too many of us. Too many of us. See, we don't need, it doesn't need to be that way. We can have the faith 
of Jesus Christ. We can be healed. He said, now, if you're healed, the prayer of faith will raise up the uh, sick person. God heals. <laughs> and he says, raising up that sick person is really a type of the resurrection from the dead. And he said, I'm the resurrection, and I do resurrect people into my family. That's how they're all going to enter into my family. I am the resurrection, he said. Of course he wasn't a man. Of course he wasn't. You can read James 5, verses 14 and 15, where it talks about the prayer of the faith. The prayer of the faith heals the sick. How many people believe God? How many people really believe that? And yet, I mean, there are just numerous scriptures that talk about that. You see, Christ says the, and prophesied that the whole world would be deceived and that we wouldn't really have faith like we ought to have. But he says, look, you can have the same faith I have. He said, I'll give you my faith. That's what that chapter's about. Building the very faith and receiving the very faith of Jesus Christ and that faith he had on this earth. How many people do you see with that kind of faith? How many people really have that kind of faith that he's talking about here? Well, let's go on down to John 21, and, the, and I'll discuss another point here about the uh, love of God and show you that well, one commentary says John 21 shouldn't even be a, a chapter. It's just like an appendix. Well, now, I disagree with that. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. John 21 is the most, one of the most powerful conclusions and perhaps could be called the, the most powerful conclusion in the Bible where it teaches a, leve, uh, a lesson about God's love and not the love of man. And almost nobody understands the love of God. So that's what the, the uh, chapter is about. It's about God's love. And you can see in Matthew 24 and verse 12, if you'd like to read it, that even God's own people in this end time let God's love wax cold. That Agape love that God gave them, because it is a gift from God. It isn't something we can work up. It's a gift from God, and they, they let, it, let themselves wax cold after they were hot, after they were really close to God. They let that love wax cold. It's prophesied to happen at the very end, and it has happened to most of God's own people. That's why I say this booklet is so profound because it really shows you where we go wrong and keeps you from getting into trouble spiritually and keeps you on track spiritually with God. And surely that's what we all want. But John appeared, or so, excuse me, Christ appeared to the disciples after he had been crucified. And you can imagine he had some pretty powerful words for them <laughs> then, and now he was a spirit being, but he manifested himself as a man to them. That's the only way they could have uh, looked upon him and lived. But he came to them after the crucifixion when most of them betrayed him or deserted him, and he came to teach them a lesson. Now, they were a rather depressed lot, at that time, because they knew it hadn't gone the way they planned or the way God had planned. But God knew they were weak. They had the Holy Spirit with them, but they didn't have it in them. And yet they were to be God's apostles, but he he's showing them that even you don't understand God's love. And they, so here he taught it to them. Let me read this in verse 15 of John 21. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, you know that I love you. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He's talking about those that are not yet sheep. He's talking about the whole world. He said, You feed anybody that will be fed. You give to them. But Peter didn't have that kind of love. That's what he's showing him. And uh, 
if you remember, Peter said, uh, though all men shall be offended because of you, yet I will never be offended. When uh, he told Christ that before he was crucified, and yet he betrayed Christ, and Christ told him he would three times during the night, and he did just that, and he wept bitterly because he didn't have the love, that agape love of God. He didn't have that. So, verse 15 says, talks about feeding my lambs, feeding those that have the potential to become sheep. And then notice verse 16, he that said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, love you me? And he said unto him, yea, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said unto him, feed my sheep. Now you, uh, here's the second part of the commission. Feed the church, feed the flock, feed my sheep, those that have already come out and have become sheep because they wanted to obey God. He said, now, Simon, your job is to feed them and to feed the, anybody else. Get this message out around the world. Give it to everybody that will show any interest. And if they not, don't have an interest, at least it will be a witness against them. You do that. You give it to them. You're, it's going to take love to do that. It's going to take love to feed the flock as well. You see, again, they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them at, at uh, the, that time, but at, uh, just a short time later at Pentecost, they did receive the Holy Spirit of God, and they did do exactly what God told them because He put His love into them. He gave them His agape love, and they gave their lives. I mean, literally gave their lives to the whole world, and all of the apostles died except John. And God had more work that He wanted him to do with the, in writing the Revelation and so on. But this is a most inspiring booklet, and I hope that you'll order it and really study it because it is truly the most profound booklet, I believe, that I have ever written. Until next time, this is Gerald Flurry. <laughs> Goodbye, friends. John's Gospel discusses many foundational and deep subjects the other books in the Bible do not. He was the only writer, for example, to explain who the Word was, the resurrection of Lazarus, and why Jesus wept, and what the example of the Samaritan woman means for the world. And no Gospel writer describes the God family vision and godly love quite like John does. John's Gospel is also the only one that speaks of that prophet, the bride, and the exchange that Christ had with the Jews where he said, you are God's, a statement that nearly got Jesus Christ killed. There's just so much depth to the Gospel of John. Our free booklet for today is titled, John's Gospel, The Love of God. Now, my father believes this is the most profound booklet that he's ever written. And if you begin a study on this subject, you'll see why. So call the number on your screen and ask for John's Gospel, The Love of God. Or if you'd like to begin your study right now, go to thetrumpetdaily.com and download the booklet instantly. Either way, the literature we offer to you is at no cost to you.